Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at East Silicon with David Axelrad. He's going to talk today about some of the issues with high-speed surveys at the most advanced process nodes. So David, what do you see as some of the problems that are coming up with high-end surveys as we start moving into things like uh, the cloud, 5G in the data center? Discussing with uh, customers, we found out that uh, networking architects are, are facing new challenges, especially with 56 gig and 112 gig. One of these challenges is the number of lanes that is exploding in the ASIC. The second one is, of course, the power consumption of the system. And that the number of lanes becomes important because we're moving just that much more data through as we move forward? That's right. If you look at the latest uh, switches, routers, and servers, we are moving from 12.8 terabits per second switches to 25.6. Um, the, the, the bandwidth is doubling, and therefore the number of service lanes that you need around your ASIC is exploding. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, I will. What are we looking at here? So here we are looking at uh, how we configure a Surdis Macro, latest generation Surdis Macro, in order to enable the, the future generation of networking switches. If we look at um, how a macro, a Surdis Macro is built, you can implement macros from one to eight lanes per common clock slice. If we look a little bit closer at uh, the architecture of, of the data lane, so for instance, data lane number one. So as you move down to seven nanometers, what's different about this, say, from 16, 14, or even 28? So back in the days, in 28 nanometer or in 16 nanometer, most of the 30s out there were analog based. What we uh, observed and quantified is that in 7 nanometer a DSP 30s is going to provide much more value to customers in terms of ability to reach longer distance at a lower uh, power metric. Typically when you get into a very dense 7 nanometer type of environment You've got a lot of contention, you've got a lot of noise coming in. How does the surveys work here? And the surveys themselves can be pretty loud too, right? Right. So what we are looking at in terms of impairments for the surveys is, of course, the system impairments, um, the, the insertion loss of, of the backplane we are trying to, to, to make work. Um, but also due to the number of service lanes that are implemented in the same ASIC, we have to deal with crosstalk. And crosstalk is a, is a very important impairment that a surgeon needs to be uh, robust against. And does that crosstalk stop at the surgeons or does it continue out into the chip as well? So the crosstalk will, will mainly um, be seen at the surgeons uh, before quantization or before the serialization of the data or deserialization. Um, and we'll be able to measure crosstalk when many 30s lanes are, are, are on and active. As you move into a, a denser architecture here, does the noise become more problematic because your um, insulator dielectric layers are thinner? Um, so there are, there are some, some impairments due to the fact that uh, the, the Nyquist frequency is, is increasing, and there are some impairments in the board or in the connectors that were not seen uh, prior to 56 and 112 gig generation. As we get into 5G, what happens? How does this change? So 5G is also a, a market that is, uh, is, is maturing now and that will require um, a lot of, uh, of new architecture. Uh, new architecture, it will require um, base stations as well as uh, remote unit uh, stations. And in order to interface the base station with the remote unit station, um, a CERDIS will be used. CERDIS are used all across the network, though. I mean, they're, they're in end edge devices. They're also in the uh, cloud. They're also in the base stations. 
What's the difference in terms of power that these use and, and what determines that power? So what determines the power is uh, the type of surveys that you are implementing. Some surveys are implemented and, and tailored to short reach application. Other surveys, like ours, is tailored for true long reach application. Um, it is therefore capable of coping with over 38 dB of insertion loss at a minimum uh, power. And power is an issue not just in the edge devices where you have a battery, it's also in a data center where you have to worry about heat and density, uh, things interacting with each other on, an, on a scale that you generally don't get in a, in a uh, handheld device, right? Right, that's right. Um, um, one of the major challenge for data center architects is also the cooling, the cooling requirements in order to be able to operate um, the, the, the chips, the ASIC, the switches, um, with a, a reasonable uh, temperature. Therefore, in the data center itself, there are places far from the, the cooling center um, which will suffer more from uh, temperature and will, which will require even more robust surveys operating at even lower power consumption. One of the issues that also is present inside of data centers cloud is um, not everything is on all the time or has to be on all the time. Sometimes they have to turn off. How does this respond to the flexible demands for uh, power as well as for um, uh, data moving? So, so in the data center, in the enterprise um, architecture, most of the services out there are on all the time. All the time. 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 10 years. Therefore, um, it's a little bit different than, uh, than a mobile or an applica or a consumer application where um, a service will be powered down or in sleep mode. In our case, um, the service will, will operate and, and remain active all the time. Is that the most power efficient way to do it or are there better ways to do it? I think it's a compromise between the, the latency that it will take to wake up a surges versus the power saving you will you'll be able to reach. Um, nowadays, with our consumer, our mobile devices, we we want um, our Facebook page or our Google page to to open up as quickly as possible. You mentioned that these have to be around for ten years, or that's their life cycle within a data center. How do they age? Is there any problem with aging over that, that period of time? Is there any uh, degradation in terms of performance? So we, we have designed a, a very robust series for, in order to meet and exceed this lifetime requirements that is needed for data center. So we have taken into account during the design phase all the aging and all the um, uh, variation in terms of system uh, variation that can occur across the 10 years. We have looked at, at the channels and how it age. We have looked at the connectors, and we have designed our studies so that uh, it's, it's fully uh, resistant and robust in order to cope and exceed this 10 years requirement. As we get down into the most advanced nodes, you generally want to be able to apply this to a lot of different things that are changing. So you think about 5G, that's a, in constant flux here. What kind of flexibility can you build in here, and how do you design that into a, uh, a chip? So in order to, to simplify the, the life of, of our customers and, and networking architects in particular, we have developed here a series um, that provides maximum flexibility and configurability to the end user. Flexibility in terms of, of programmation, um, and flexibility also in terms of clocking architecture. In order to do that, we have basically implemented an MCU controlled service with an MCU integrated inside our clock slice. And in addition to that, we have also engineered an architecture that allows to support any data rate on any data lane. But even further than that, you can support any data rate on the TX and any data rate on the RX concurrently. 
what kind of expertise was needed in order to, to make this work? So in order to make a DSP-based series, you have the combination of both worlds. You have highlighted in blue here the analog part of the series that is very complex. The ADC is a key part that needs to be designed very accurately. And you have the marriage between the analog and the digital with the DSP-based design. You have to design a very power efficient, very configurable FFE in the digital domain, as well as a robust DFE. Both of these blocks were designed in analog in the past. To build a, a compelling DSP series, you need both talent, the analog talent and the digital talent. David Axelrad, thank you very much for a great explanation. Thank you very much.